welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I'm the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since 1996. You can read all of my written work there at Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to click the link to my other podcast. It's actually a newly revamped podcast. It used to be called the Quipster Film Review Podcast, but... If you've been listening to that podcast, you know that there are changes afoot, and I'll be talking about some of those changes toward the end of this particular episode of Around the World in 80s Movies. But if you do go there, I do encourage you to click the link to the new podcast that I'm doing called To the 90s and Beyond, and I'll explain much more about that in a little bit. Today, I'm going to be getting into the third part of this three-part series, looking at the Poltergeist films of the 1980s. The movie that I'm going to be doing today pretty much killed (laughs) the franchise, at least for a while. Poltergeist 3 came out in 1988, and it it was rated PG-13. It does have scary images, teen drinking, and some language. The runtime is an hour and 38 minutes. The returning cast are Heather O'Rourke and Zelda Rubinstein. The rest of the cast, Tom Skerritt, Nancy Allen, Lara Flynn Boyle, Kip Wentz, Richard Fire, and Nate Davis. The director is Gary Sherman. Sherman co-writes the screenplay with Brian Taggart. Now, before the completion of Poltergeist 2, before it even came out, MGM was already making plans for a third entry. However, they knew that both Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams, they were paid exorbitantly to have to return for part two. They knew they weren't going to be so lucky with part three, neither actor anyway was enough of a box office draw to justify paying even more of a price tag, especially once they found out Poltergeist 2 wasn't going to make that much money in the end. Much cheaper were some of the other actors that were synonymous with the franchise, Heather O'Rourke, Zelda Rubenstein, even Julian Beck made quite an impression to them as they were making Poltergeist 2. They were mostly unknown outside of the franchise, so they could be had very cheaply. Now, if they could put those characters into maybe a a different scenario, they should be able to maintain franchise credibility while not having to overspend on the other talent that really didn't help the bottom line. Now, Poltergeist co-writers and Poltergeist 2 writer-producers, Mark Victor and Michael Grace, they declined to continue at this point. They didn't see any need in further Poltergeist films. So, MGM contacted Gary Sherman. Now, Sherman was somebody that they originally had sought out for Poltergeist 2. He was in the mix of potential directors, but at that time, he was too busy making his 1986 action film called Wanted, Dead or Alive. But they eagerly sought him for part three. Now, Sherman, he had a low-budget horror pedigree through efforts like Raw Meat and Dead and Buried, but he'd been trying to branch out into other genres since then. He wasn't particularly keen on the idea of returning, especially since this was going to be a sequel, and he would probably suffer by having comparisons to Steven Spielberg. But MGM's then-president, Alan Ladd Jr., and the head of film production for MGM, Jay Cantor, they had originally gave Sherman his first break in films with his 1973 debut, Rami, a.k.a. Deathline, In addition to that, they were Sherman's mentors over the years, and he really couldn't simply say no to them. He felt he had some obligations there, but he did have some conditions if they really did want him to come back. First, Sherman wanted to film entirely in his hometown, Chicago, Illinois. He also wanted the film specifically set, if they could get it, at the John Hancock Center. That was a place that he had been planning on staging for a long time, a heist movie, He was developing, but he was really stagnating on where to go with it. And lastly, he had long wanted to do an effects movie where all of the effects were going to be done live. He didn't want post-production opticals. He figured CG was on its way to being the dominant force in visual effects, and he wanted to do like the last really big film where live effects were done throughout the whole movie. Now, to pitch this idea, Sherman reasoned with them that the first film was set in suburbia, the second was in mostly in a rural location, and so the third really should be different than those. It should be more of an urban setting. Sherman grew up in a high-rise Chicago apartment building that seemed very much like a contained city like you would find in the John Hancock Center, and he could draw from his own childhood experiences and some of the trouble he could get into while he was living in the building confines. 
Now, one story challenge that he did have in his pitch was that the hauntings in the prior films did tie into dead bodies buried in the ground. So, you know, this new building was very different. It's in a different city, thousands of miles away. You know, maybe that wouldn't work. But he did think of a loophole. After observing that modern buildings were full of mirrored surfaces, he thought of Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, where mirrors served as portals to another dimension. The other side, as depicted in the first two Poltergeist movies, could be traversed by the spirit realm, potentially, if the forces were powerful enough to make this happen. Now, the only non-budgetary story requirement from MGM was that it should center on the character of Carol Ann. So Shorman secured Brian Taggart, who had helped him do a rewrite on Wanted Dead or Alive, and they had a really good rapport. He brought him into co-script. The original film had the catchphrase, they're here, and the second one, they're back. So their initial title was going to be, We're Back, Poltergeist 3. That later evolved to, We're Back, Poltergeist Continues, and then Poltergeist 3, colon, We're Back. Marketing really determined that the phrase, We're Back, didn't quite connect with audiences. So eventually, later in the process, the title would change to Poltergeist 3, colon, the final chapter, before they eventually settled simply on Poltergeist 3. Now, in the story, Carol Ann, she would be staying for some time with her biological aunt, Patricia, her new husband, Bruce Gardner, and Bruce's teenage daughter, Donna. The Gardners live in this newly built, multi-purpose Chicago high-rise where Bruce also serves as the superintendent. Carol Ann, meanwhile, is enrolled in this school for gifted but troubled kids. The school's skeptical therapist, Dr. Seaton, thinks Carol Ann is hypnotizing other people into believing in her delusions. That's why other people have experienced them. Seton forces Carol Ann to speak about her experiences, bringing to light her involvement with the dreaded Reverend Kane, who, it turns out, begins contacting her again, and he's drawing power from this new building, eventually using that power to cross dimensions through its many mirrors. Meanwhile, psychic Tangina Barons telepathically senses Carol Ann's danger. She returns to save the child from being stolen to the other side by Kane once again. Prior to filmmaking, Sherman had worked as an associate professor for animation and optical effects at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He also worked part-time at a Chicago optical effects house. So he would tap into his broad knowledge to concoct very clever illusions here. It was going to be one big magic trick throughout the whole movie. Duplicate sets, different types of mirrors, optical flats of various densities that allowed various amounts of pass-through light as well as reflection. Images would be added to mirrored surfaces using beam splitting technology that are commonly found in optical printers. Extensive instructions, really elaborate storyboarding involving maps, floor plans, shot lists, smoke effects, lighting instructions. Those were all meticulously designed before they would even start filming. As the scenes were set up, the actors could use that time to spend hours rehearsing their timing, their movements that were required to make this magic trick happen. Body doubles would also be employed for some of those illusions with reverse makeup and hairstyles and wardrobe from their acting mime counterparts. For the role of Aunt Patricia, Nancy Allen, her agent suggested that she take up the role after she was doing this film in Rome that had its financing collapse. She didn't really like the second Poltergeist film, so her first impulse was to turn it down, but he encouraged her to read the script, and she did, and she liked that the character that she would be portraying was different than she had been typically offered throughout her career up to that point. She was a sophisticated and glamorous career woman, and she found the story otherwise intriguing enough to potentially restore the luster of the Poltergeist franchise. Nancy Allen was chosen over the runner-up Season Hubley, who starred in Sherman's 1982 thriller called Vice Squad, and that was primarily because Sherman felt that Nancy Allen was much more believable as being Jo Beth Williams' sister. By the way, Williams did give Nancy Allen some advice. She told her she should stay in shape because the physical demands of a Poltergeist movie were unlike anything she had ever experienced. Allen did find that physicality very nerve-wracking, especially the fact that she had to be wet throughout most of that, but O'Rourke and her professionalism did have a calming effect on the other actors. Meanwhile, Tom Skerritt took the 
other starring role, the uncle part, because he did like the script. It reminded him somewhat of Alien when he read it, and he respected Sherman as a filmmaker. He wasn't particularly a fan, though, once he got on set of the persistent waiting for these effects to be set up. The movie set was it was very isolated, and it didn't allow him, unlike other movie sets, to walk off and have fun elsewhere to wait things out like he did when he was making Alien. The Scarret found the shoot physically challenging. He dubbed the daily feats he would have to perform the Poltergeist Olympics. Things weren't always smooth on the set. Scarret did make a, a few jokes that co-star Alan did find offensive, and that resulted in some unintended friction between them. Alan says it's actually the only instance of personal strife that she'd ever had with a fellow actor in her career. Poltergeist 3 also marks 17-year-old Lara Flynn Boyle's first film role. Sherman had cast her in his pilot for his intended series called Sable and thought that she would work very well for the teenager in this film. For the psychiatrist, they envisioned uh, kind of a Dirk Bogart or Louis Hayworth type. They ended up filling the role with a Chicago-based actor and playwright called Richard Fire, who was a, a longtime acquaintance of Sherman's. MGM did manage to rent portions of the John Hancock Center for about a week. It was difficult because the rest of the building was open to the public, so they had to share resources on occasion. The film, though, fictitiously renames the John Hancock Center into the George Wellington Streeter Center, and that is in honor of this shady, eccentric entrepreneur who became a beloved Chicago historical figure in real life. Also renamed was Donna's High School. It was called the Francis W. Parker School, but it got renamed to the Edward F. Letting School, the film's production manager who often found a way to put his name somewhere into the films he worked on. Shooting in the John Hancock Center went relatively smooth, but the window washing rig, 100 stories up, that was kind of unnerving, especially with the Chicago winds. Eventually, they did need more time and more space than was available, so they had to recreate selected corridors and rooms, complete with furnishings, at that nearby warehouse within this Chicago factory complex that became their makeshift studio. Now, doing the film entirely in Chicago, they did lack some of the luxuries of Hollywood resources. Astro, which was Chicago's largest motion picture lab, was used to process and display the dailies. Now, as Sherman viewed them, he loved the cleaner aesthetic of knowing that his film was not going to go through the extensive post-production process that typically degrades the image and the clarity and resolution of modern visual effects dominant films. And although intended to be economical, Sherman's insistence on live effects techniques did save them very little money, it turns out, in the end. Despite all of the meticulous preparation that he did, mishaps did tend to abound during the production, including for Sherman, who broke his foot while he was doing this dolly tracking shot that went awry. He was saddled in a wheelchair for about a week. He was unable to move around the set. There were a lot of cables around without having to be carried by others. And then after that, he was in crutches hobbling around for you know weeks after that. And meanwhile, his foot would throb madly from the liquid nitrogen used for fog effects throughout a lot of this film. Other mishaps included the weather, specifically for the scheduled exterior work. There were sequences that needed to be done atop the high-rise that was plagued by fog, and it required hours of waiting for that fog to dissipate. And once it did, it was too sunny, oftentimes, to match the gloomy look that they needed to match other shots, and that resulted in additional postponements. The schedule for the film also jumbled when Zelda Rubenstein suddenly became unavailable for about a week after her mother's passing. With Rubenstein's departure, they were forced to move up the Carol Ann and Reverend Kane sequences up in the schedule, and that required a real rush job for the makeup consultant Dick Smith and his protégés that he'd worked with on 1983's The Hunger, John Caglione and Doug Drexler. And since they had decided to go with Kane for the third film, Julian Beck, died after finishing his scenes for Poltergeist 2, so the role of Kane required recasting. After meeting with a number of actors, Dick Smith determined that Chicago actor Nate Davis, coincidentally the father of director Andrew Davis of the Fugitive fame, he had a similar facial structure to Beck's, and with some prosthetic skin and hair and teeth, he probably could pass very well as Kane, except his voice. Davis would, in post-production, be dubbed by uncredited voice actor Corey Burton. Burton had replaced Beck's voice somewhat in ADR as needed for Poltergeist 2, 
Burton, to get into the role, he had to smoke cigarettes before recording to give his voice the raspy nature required. Sherman did also write in occasions that required Carol Ann to appear as Kane in her facial features. Dick Smith felt that baby-faced O'Rourke looking evil that was going to come off more silly than scary, especially because she had very full cheeks at that time, and it didn't lend well to putting on prosthetic applications. So Sherman agreed to hire body doubles for some of the more elaborate makeups. Additional mishaps include a major one, a scene in an underground parking garage that proved to be probably the worst day of the principal shoot. The cast and crew already hated the claustrophobic conditions enough. Fans were kicking up, swirling dust and smoke all over the place. It was hard to breathe. It was hard to stand around. And visibility for the stunt drivers through all of this polystyrene that was coated all over the cars to simulate frost, it was nearly non-existent for them. And the worst day came when those cars... Where they were supposed to catch fire in the underground parking garage, but an unexpected explosion occurred in heaps of smoke, and that fire caused about $250,000 in structural damage. And the blast also injured a maintenance worker and two firefighters there, and all 150 members of the crew and the cast had to be evacuated. So very costly on top of that quarter million dollars in structural damage as well. Meanwhile, all of these unforeseen events occurring did cause them to fall behind in time and expenses, so dialogue scenes had to be hastily revised by Sherman himself. Co-writer Taggart's services were unavailable during the shoot. Sometimes when Sherman had no dialogue for the actors, he just had them shout, Carol Ann! Carol Ann! An overuse of her name so absurd, there are now very popular YouTube videos containing the 121 instances of someone shouting out, Carol Ann! In addition, some scenes were abridged and others just never filmed, mainly character moments involving the family that referenced the prior films. In addition, ambitious action sequences, especially including one involving Bruce battling a Japanese statue from Patricia's art gallery that eventually reveals itself as Kane, those ambitious sequences had to be either replaced with something simpler or just removed altogether. The worst sacrifice, though, for Sherman was that he had intended a very lengthy and much more elaborate ending for this film that would spotlight Carol Ann and Tangina, giving them really good character moments that would culminate in them switching bodies using this very, very tricky makeup illusion where they would tear off their faces while they're traversing the mirror dimension with Carol Ann morphing into Tangina and vice versa was all very, very elaborate. MGM, though, by this point, deem it as just too costly for the remaining budget, and they ordered Sherman to devise a much more scaled-back ending for the film. Sherman's new ending that he concocted involved Patricia finding her family encased in ice, and Kane nearly victorious, and then Tangina has some emotional moments with a tearful Carol Ann before ultimately sacrificing herself by escorting Kane into the light, restoring the family in the end. Sherman loathed having to do this new ending, but he was hopeful that MGM would eventually, once they see the film, agree that it needed something more and allow him to proceed with the ending that he had intended, perhaps in reshoots. Indeed, once Poltergeist 3 did wrap, test audiences reacted pretty poorly to the early cut, especially this ending where they found the effects work was unconvincing and the scares nearly non-existent. And in particular, the acting by O'Rourke and Rubenstein was deemed not really strong enough to carry the emotional weight that was required during those scenes. Despite attempts to try to edit around the weaknesses there, Rubenstein would eventually receive still her second Razzie nomination for Worst Supporting Actress as Tangina. MGM still wanted Sherman to do some additional work to try to fix the ending's issues and especially make it scarier, but that would have to wait at least for a while because Sherman did have a commitment to NBC to continue his Sable series. After Sherman's hiatus, preparation did begin for those reshoots, and that's when the bottom completely dropped out of this picture. On February 1st, 1988, Heather O'Rourke tragically died. Heather had been rushed to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pain, and she died on the operating table during intestinal surgery. The official cause of her death was cardiac and pulmonary arrest from the septic shock caused by congenital stenosis of the intestine, essentially a severe blockage of this abnormally narrow portion of her bowels that she had apparently had since birth but went undiagnosed through her life. Many voiced concerned afterwards that this was not caught sooner because O'Rourke had been taken to the hospital for illness 
on several occasions shortly before the shoot and also had failed the cast physical. Meanwhile, physicians at various times had diagnosed her malady as initially the flu or an insect bite reaction or a parasite infestation from untreated well water and eventually early stage Crohn's disease where the physician prescribed cortisone treatments that caused the swollen cheeks and neck that you see evidenced in this film. Afterward, O'Rourke's mother did file a wrongful death lawsuit against the hospital, which was settled in arbitration for an undisclosed sum. Most of O'Rourke's pallbearers were professionals that she worked with. They included Henry Winkler, the Fonz from Happy Days. Heather had worked for a season toward the end of the run of that show. Heather's manager, Mike Meyer, her agent and family friend, David Wardlow, as well as Poltergeist 3's director, Gary Sherman, and the producer, Barry Bernardi. Sherman called the day of Heather O'Rourke's funeral the worst day of his life. He had come to know and become very close to Heather during her time there. In fact, he said he wanted to adopt her. Now, this was all following, of course, as we talked about on previous episodes, Dominique Dunn's murder after the release of the first film, Julian Beck's terminal cancer after the wrap of production in the second film, and so O'Rourke's was the third death of a prominent actor connected to the release of a Poltergeist film. Or the fourth, if you count Poltergeist 2's Will Sampson, who passed away during this heart-lung transplant while they were shooting Poltergeist 3. Unsurprisingly, though, rumors quickly spread of a cursed franchise, and that's something that often gets discussed when discussing the Poltergeist franchise today. It was cursed, according to people who fancy such things, because they had used real skeletons during the making of the first two films, although that was a common practice for many other films that didn't have this supposed curse, so it could be just a coincidence. Now, getting back to the film at hand, Sherman could not now film the ending that he wanted because of O'Rourke's absence, and he had dismal scores from test audiences for what existed. So Sherman and Ladd and Cantor pondered maybe they should shelve the film indefinitely. Alan Ladd Jr. loved children. He didn't even want to think about trying to market a film with a dead 12-year-old in it. And Sherman, in particular, could not stomach thinking of having to look at footage of Heather while in the cutting room trying to tinker with the various revisions MGM wanted. However... MGM was in dire financial straits. Its board of directors felt they had invested just too much money to see this film get put on the shelf for a franchise that was meant to draw in money. They insisted that the film should be completed on time with a new ending that did not show a lifeless O'Rourke. And if they had to, they were going to proceed with or without Sherman. Sherman hated the thought of returning, but he hated more the thought of somebody else butchering his film. So he reluctantly agreed to continue with the reshoot. During this process, working with the existing footage of O'Rourke and trying to finagle a better ending was deemed impossible by Sherman, as well as obviously being demoralizing. His sorrow at Heather's passing turned eventually to hatred of this situation and then eventually apathy for the fate of his film. After adding more intense moments with Kane, he just slapped together a quick pickup shot using a body double for O'Rourke that didn't show her face. And that would be an ironic twist for the film, Heather O'Rourke literally being replaced by a lookalike after passing to the other side, just like, I guess, happens for her character in the movie. And during this process, Scott, Donna's love interest in the movie, played by Kip Wentz, he remains on the other side at the end of the film because they neglected to even ask Wentz to return to film his scene. As much as he wanted to put it behind him, however, Sherman's new cut did fall significantly short of the required length for delivery of this new film. So rather than have to do additional reshoots on top of this, Sherman decided to get around all of that by slowing the speed of the opening credits as well as the end credits and then cobbling together enough material using outtakes and previously discarded segments of the film to pad out the remaining runtime. Now, Sherman knew that this was really throwing off the pacing of the movie. It was going to leave holes in the story. But by this point, he just wanted to put all of this behind him. He just didn't care, frankly, anymore about what happened to the movie. Unsurprisingly, test screening reactions were negative overall. And they deemed the movie just terrible. So rather than spend any more money trying to fix something that was likely to be At this point, permanently broken, MGM decided to just dump what they had into theaters and recoup whatever they could. Meanwhile, MGM's marketing department, they encountered their own dilemmas with 
O'Rourke's passing. They performed test screenings to try to gauge the audience's reaction to seeing the deceased young star on the screen, as well as what they thought of the dedication to her during the film's closing credits. But what they really struggled with was how to sell this film without seeming exploitative or offending potential audiences because of Heather's death. They removed a shot of Heather from their first trailer, performing the line, Guess Who's Back in Town. They also held back the film's stars from doing interviews to promote the film because they wanted to avoid these morose questions that would dwell on O'Rourke's death or any notions of this curse on the franchise. Tom Skerritt did think that the studio hiding O'Rourke was really exacerbating an already awkward situation because he felt the film is already dedicated to her memory and she's wonderful in it that her work should be celebrated instead of hidden. Although over the years, Gary Sherman has become proud of a lot of the techniques that he did manage to pull off given the circumstances, he does proclaim Poltergeist 3 as a major disappointment in his career and for a variety of reasons, the least favorite of his films. He does say that if he had the chance, he could probably go back and make a good film out of what he was trying to do, but that ship has sailed, unfortunately. And so what we're left with is a broken film for most people. Poltergeist 3 received on its release Little Fanfare. It debuted at number five before falling out of the top 10 in the US. It earned a very lowly $14 million domestically. Unfortunately, this entry would be much more known, much more publicized for O'Rourke's passing. Interest in continuing the franchise beyond her waned. Deservedly so. There were a lot of problems with this endeavor that should have broken just about any franchise because it put most of its scares into strobe lighting effects, fog machines, literally smoke and mirrors to try to drum up frights. It's a lot less terrifying than your neighborhood mock haunted house on Halloween. The original 1982 Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg film, you know, that was an A-list production all of the way. The second was a significant step down, but it still was a respectable effort to try to continue the story of the Freelings. But Poltergeist 3, from its inception, really was wrong-headed. It was a, a studio cash-in while there were still embers in the fire. The lackluster quality would already have washed the last flickers out if it wasn't for the tragedy of O'Rourke and all of the production problems that plagued Sherman throughout this film. Smoke and Mirrors really cannot disguise that Poltergeist 3 is a poorly executed, ill-conceived excuse for scares for most people. It's barely worthy of a straight-to-video release. Outside of these nifty camera tricks, it really is a difficult film for most people to watch. And outside of the unfortunate demise of the child star, it's close to impossible to really remember much of it long after you see it. So for all of this, I can only give Poltergeist 3 objectively one and a half stars out of four. One and a half stars on my scale means that I do think Poltergeist 3 is a poor movie and not one I would recommend to most people. It actually has its share of fans. There is a cult audience for this, but I can say that about just about any movie <laughs> of the 1980s. It eventually finds its audience. I don't care how bad the film is. There are people that usually like it, mostly people who saw it when they were kids. So one and a half stars really is honestly the best I could give Poltergeist 3. Now, even though this effectively killed the franchise at this point, the franchise actually did continue on, maybe not necessarily in film form. In fact, as early as January of 1989, Poltergeist, the series, was announced as a possibility for a syndicated show. It went into development, but it was actually never made. In the early 1990s, there actually was discussion of perhaps doing a fourth Poltergeist film. This time it would be a prequel showing Reverend Kane's rise and his earthly demise eventually, but that actually didn't go anywhere either. By the mid-1990s, Showtime started running seasons of Poltergeist The Legacy, which would also be followed by one season on the Sci-Fi Channel, so four seasons of that show. The show didn't actually directly tie into the movies, although Gary Sherman did get hired for the 1997 season, including writing and directing one of the episodes he was executive producer for that season. And there it remained mostly dormant until 2015 somebody decided to create a substandard remake of the 1982 film that starred Sam Rockwell. It's a movie mostly forgotten, even though it only came out a few years ago. Forgotten so much that in 2019, just a few years later, the Russo brothers, who were given free reign essentially to remake just about whatever they wanted in the MGM back catalog, they were considering bringing back Poltergeist, maybe a new movie, probably a TV show, and that's where it has remained in limbo 
ever since there's not a lot of new news other than the fact that they have the capability of making poltergeist and the desire if they can think of something unique to do with it so will we see poltergeist again well it's probably a good chance given that it has name recognition but whether they can make something good out of it that also will remain to be seen i'm hopeful someday we'll see a return to the glory of the original film that's it for the Poltergeist series. If you have your own thoughts on the Poltergeist films that you want to impart, if you want to really champion Poltergeist 3 as a worthy film, you can do so by writing to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Links to my Twitter feed, my Facebook page, my Instagram are also there. You can get in touch with me any one of those ways. I do think that email is the easiest way to get in touch, though. As far as what I'm going to be doing next week, well, we're going to continue on with a little bit of the haunted house treatment. We're going to go back, actually, to the 1970s for the next show, 1979 to be exact, for the original film of the Amityville Horror. So check that out if you want to keep up with the reviews for the next episode. And that will actually kind of kick in eventually to the other show that I'm going to be doing. To the 90s and beyond will be the companion program to around the world in 80s movies. A lot of the movies that I stopped at the end of the 1980s that continued into the 90s, like the Batman films and other things, well, I'm going to be doing those films very much in a similar format on to the 90s and beyond. And the reason why it's called and beyond is because it's not going to be strictly films of the 1990s. Sometimes, as we do with the 80s show, I'm going to continue on with some of the newer movies that tie into these franchises that were done in the 80s and 90s. So along those lines, I'm going to be kicking off the first official episode of To the 90s and Beyond with a franchise that is just getting remade in theaters and on HBO Max, the Mortal Kombat series. We're going to go back to the original 1995 Mortal Kombat from Paul W.S. Anderson and considered by many people to be the greatest video game adaptation of its era, maybe of all time. I don't know. We'll get into that. If you're interested in films of the 1990s and you have not subscribed to the Quipster Film Review Podcast, I do encourage you to go to quipster.net and clicking the link to To the 90s and Beyond and getting that subscription ready for what is about to come. If, if you're already somebody who follows the Quipster Film Review Podcast in your podcast player, you won't have to do anything. It's, it's just going to get replaced right there in your feed. Nothing more for you to do to get those episodes when they come out. I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you're excited about that too. But until then, we still have the 80s show to continue. And for that, I do thank you for continuing to join me on this journey around the world in 80s movies. 